Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ruth Wabodi. She's a new faculty member here at the University of Nebraska, but brings a wealth of industry experience, which she can describe related to uh, some of the things Jesse was talking about on auditing and things. Very excited to have her in our in a research teaching and extension position focused on animal behavior and, and uh, welfare. Ruth, thanks for doing this today. Thanks, Galen. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. And again, excited to be joining such a, a high caliber lineup to, to discuss some pertinent issues right now. Um, as it pertains to the feedlot sector. And you know, having worked uh, a number of years, both with audit development program implementation and auditing, actually um, I hold all five PACO um, auditor certifications. So auditing across all sectors of the industry, you know, I'm particularly interested in dispelling you know, the audit mystique. So as you heard from Jesse, the, the US cattle industry feedyard audit tool includes an evaluation of cattle handling as well as you know, a review of training that's provided to employees pertinent to their job responsibilities. So uh, this kind of brings me to my subject today. It, it's a perfect segue, you know, and what I'd like you to think about today, some of the material I'll, I'll be covering is presented as a step or a way to actually help you be better prepared for the audit process and to help ensure that that process goes more smoothly. We'll be focusing really on um, some concepts around animal handling, the development of animal handling programs, uh, talking about the impact of specific handling practices and recognizing some of um, our progress to this point in time, certainly as an industry, it's very essential for us to mark our progress um, and then also look to the future. Obviously, we talk you know, all the time about continuous improvement. So I'll be talking about where some of those, our opportunities lie in each of those areas. So Jesse did a really nice job also just talking about um, the, the Beef Quality Assurance Program, you know, the, the impetus towards auditing. But I've captured here, you know, some of the, the really um, familiar signature faces around some of the stockmanship and stewardship uh, training that's been um, associated with beef quality assurance. Um, Kurt Pate and Ron Gill are illustrated here. So certainly um, very familiar faces, you know, and, and these concepts are, are not new concepts, right? We talk about handling, low stress handling practices, um, these issues are, are front and center. So you might ask, you know, why do we keep talking about them? Why are we still talking about them? You know, it's kind of old hat. So when is enough enough? Well, the reason why I keep talking about it is because there is still opportunity for improvement, right? And also because the feedlot sector relies very heavily on, on humans, right? Humans for handling animals. And with people with human comes what? Variability, right? We have the animal component, the variability of individual animals, but we also have the variability of humans. And you put those two together and it's a recipe for interesting challenges, right? But it certainly leads to, there are a lot of inconsistencies that we encounter and inconsistencies can also mean lost revenue. So we'll talk a little bit about where some of the costs, you know, occur across the feed yard. Obviously, um, acquisition of cattle, if they're being purchased, right, is the, the primary cost, then it goes to, to feed, right? Feed's one of our, our major um, resources that we invest in, followed somewhat by a distant third, uh, which is employee labor, right? But it's, a, it's above some of the other input costs. While this is a really nice and pretty simplistic graphic, what it doesn't really do is capture um, some of the hidden costs associated with uh, labor specifically. And some of the hidden costs uh, can be associated with employee turnover, right? Employee injury, and then also the impact of animal handling. Really, these can all be tied or traced to training on a certain level, right? And we think about that, 
as we think about opportunity, right? Turnover might occur. It might be driven by difficult work conditions. It's, you know, we're certainly well acquainted with the, the long hours, but also exposure to environment, you know, the, um, some of the severe weather, right? We think of um, exposure that we would have had in the last couple of weeks with extreme weather events, right? So those are the types of things that contribute to difficult working conditions. Certainly the physical aspect of it, right? It's, it's not easy work. When you have human um, interacting, there's always the opportunity for um, instructions to get lost in translation as it were, right? So whether instructions are unclear or objectives might be unclear, there, there's still opportunity for, for frustration there um, and, and for, again, variability. Employees um, oftentimes cite not feeling valued as one of the reasons why they will leave, uh, leave a job and not feeling valid, valued is also tied to, in some cases, limited training or opportunity for development. And this was one of the, the main um, concerns that was, uh, there were a couple that were articulated to me in just in the months that I've been here in this position already. Some of the primary concerns around um, employees in the, in the feedlot sector have to do with injury and turnover. So, that's where um, this question kind of arises from. So when we talk about injury and we look at agriculture as a whole, injuries as a result of livestock handling activities um, are the second or third leading cause of injuries on the farm. Again, that could be uh, unclear instructions, but oftentimes injuries from, from livestock is directly related to um, a reduction in our own vigilance, right? We let our guard down. We become very comfortable being around animals. And we sort of, we often will violate what that, what we understand to be that cardinal rule. And that is not being watchful, right? Because we're, we're dealing with animals that are unpredictable. And whether it's perhaps truly a lack of vigilance or the nature of being distracted. Uh, I think as our workforce changes also, the opportunity for distraction certainly increases. It's not uncommon now, right, to see a processing crew with earbuds in, right? And that would have been, that's a distraction that wouldn't have been the case in, in previous years. As we talk about the costs actually related to handling, you know, there's certainly a relationship between training and some of our handling outcomes. And what I mean by handling outcomes are actually some of those categories that, that Jesse so well describes um, as part of the, the feed yard assessment tool, right? So, so the outcomes of interest when we're talking about handling might be how animals are captured in the squeeze chute. So improper capture is, is an outcome of interest whether animals jump and run, whether they slip, slip and fall, vocalization, so forth. And each, each handling event in the feed yard is associated not only with certain fixed costs, but there's also hidden costs. And those costs uh, focus uh, center around inaccuracy or consistency. That's kind of the theme of what I'm getting at today. But there, there is this compound effect that I'll, I'll dive into uh, just a little bit more here. It's helpful to think about uh, the, the compound effect, if you will, when we're talking about the categories, uh, the handling categories, those outcomes of interest. So illustrated here are some of the primary um, outcomes, outcome measures captured in the feed yard assessment tool, things that can be measured, right? Electric pride use, vocalization, improper capture, slips, falls, jumping and running. And I illustrate these, um, as talking points for a specific reason, right? Uh, the, if you'll recall, I, I believe Jesse mentioned that the target for improper capture uh, is zero percent, meaning that there's there's zero tolerance, right? And while that alone, you know, isn't a criteria for a failed audit, it, it's certainly an important category, right? In a study uh, that I conducted in grad school we found that there, there was certainly an impact related to that, right? 
we built a model that said that if those latter three conditions, improper capture, slips and falls, jumping and running, if those three were experienced by, by an animal in their first handling event upon receival at a feed yard, that that would mean 10 pounds difference in that finishing period. And our closeout data showed that that actually meant in that set of cattle, 25 pounds difference. So those animals gained that much less, um, partly due to those those conditions, right? So it, there's there's indication, right, that suggests that there there's certainly a compound effect, right? So if one of those events occurred by itself, the the impact on the animal wasn't quite as significant, but added together, it certainly had a significant impact. And I mentioned this idea of training also having a compound effect and, and there being hidden costs. So now we think about the potential for some of those um, opportunities and variability to show up, whether it's gathering cattle from the pens, whether it's moving them through the alley, whether it's working in the processing barn, the loadout scale, any one of those areas. And obviously, when cattle are moved from their home pens to, to either be processed or, or to load out, obviously then there's an opportunity for variability in several of those categories, right? So, you know, even though there is not currently uh, a, a really defined metric, we, we don't have a really solid understanding really of uh, the cost, the true cost associated uh, with this variability in handling, it, it's relatively easy to see where we can incur losses over time, right? We tend to, I think we have this tendency to think about handling as a, you know, having a relatively small impact and that, you know, each event is maybe a standalone event. But if we, if we think about, um, the sequence of handling and then breaking those handling events into these sections, we can start to think about areas where we can reduce variability through training, right? So we, we train to some of those targets of interest that I've talked about. <clears throat> now, this is where it gets particularly interesting for me in, in the framework of beef quality assurance, low stress cattle handling, teaching the stockmanship and stewardship program. These programs have done, um, helped make tremendous advances uh, in formal training, um, informal training, interactive training, uh, and certainly bringing this issue of the importance of animal handling front and center. But what's important to know also is that these types of, of training, uh, these programs really focus on principles, big principles, concepts, and strategies. And, and they're not so concerned with, with the finer detail. And the detail is where truly the variability lies, right? So one of the ways to kind of illustrate this thought, I, I found a quote from uh, an author that I, I read quite a bit, James Clare. And it really gets at this concept that when we focus on the little details, the tiny details, that's where we make the difference, right? And for an industry that's under fire, right, faced with scrutiny, every opportunity for us to look at being 1% better than you know, our respective competitors, being 1% better in our field, in our industry. Those are the opportunities that don't um, incur a lot of cost for us to add value. So by doing that, when we, we shift that focus and we start to uh, implement training programs to deliver training that's focused on the little detail, we have a better ability to control uh, some of the outcomes, right? We then uh, 
have repeatability, right? We have precision because we're focusing on little details that are much easier to control than bigger concepts. A, a very simple example of that would be um, a, a minute detail would be a number, the number of times an animal turns back, you know, a single animal turns back when being gathered from a pen. If we focus on training to that level of detail, right, that that's a, a mechanism for reducing variability. And in doing that, you know, what I'm talking about is essentially reverse engineering our, our training, right? We understand now what the, the targets are, as Jesse talked about, what, what the audit criteria will be, those outcomes of interest. And now that we understand them, we also know our, our work well enough, right? We know cattle handling the concept well enough to know now where those areas of variability um, occur. And I'm suggesting that we design our training a little better to prepare us better for upcoming audits. So I'm talking about structured training and feedback. Feedback then ties back to that uh, adding value to the employee. We're also dealing with um, a shifting demographic. Our, our workforce uh, is asking for more feedback, more continuous feedback than previously too. Uh, being able to to connect them to the performance data of the cattle to actually understand in real time the impact of the, the training that they've gone through and then their efforts meaningful for them right it'll be important to measure the training that we actually deliver and then to quantify the impact of training on animal performance right and connecting those employees i think to that um, that impact that data. We're currently uh, developing uh, a curriculum and have planned to deliver structured training in pilots later this year. Part of this plan includes quantifying proficiency um, in some of the areas that I've described, but it also you know, includes um, this framework, right? So a progression through five levels of mastery and that that's borrowed from other disciplines, right? But, but the, 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 the working idea with a mastery system is that as an individual moves through these levels of mastery and demonstrates proficiency, there's also added responsibility, right? Ownership associated with those progressive levels. And when we're dealing with uh, a living being um, animal with that as our commodity, our, our you know, focal interest, that responsibility is critical. Again, feedback in order to you know, positively reinforce that the good habits, the little details that contribute to that 1% difference, right? We're interested in forming good habits. So again, that, that feedback loop is critical in this structure. You know, in an industry that is dealing with incredibly narrow margins, right? Every opportunity where we can identify that helps us reduce costs means another dollar that can stay in the feeder pocket. So with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. Any questions for Ruth? I don't see any in the chat box either. Um, if you have questions for Ruth and you want to follow up, her contact information is provided there.